Hi, everybody. Andrew Champagne here alongside J.D. Fox for this week's edition of Champagne and J.D. You may notice this looks a little bit different. J.D. did a couple of really cool things with the graphical setup that we've got going on here. And you can notice some cool little factoids about us down at the bottom of the screen. We'll be updating those every week. There's going to be some pretty amusing little factoids from the both of us. And there's some stuff in there for you that you may very well want as far as information is concerned. So if you're listening to us and you don't want to look at our mugs, look at the scroll down there and, you know, maybe you'll find something a little more entertaining. Maybe, and and you might see a picture of a nice beach, which I co have complete license to use. I had to make really? sure. Really? Wow, that's there impressive. Only we only got one though, so we got to we got to make it count. Indeed, and if you're interested in advertising, there we go. That email address right there. It will be monitored. We'll get back to you, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Busy, busy week on this week's show. We've got a lot of ground that we've got to cover, both on track and off. But first. My father was out here this past weekend. We were looking for a whole bunch of fun things to do, and plot twist, there weren't a whole ton of fun things to do because coronavirus has closed everything. So we wound up staying in, playing a lot of races, and if you've been following me on Twitter at Ad Andrew Champagne, you saw I hit a couple of tickets, you saw my dad hit a couple of tickets, and we had a lot of fun up at Woodbine, a lot of activities up there, and JD, I know that's one of your favorite tracks to play. Yeah, that's that's definitely the circuit that I eat, sleep, and breathe every day. Obviously, Australia is a, a big part of my racing repertoire, but you know, you've got they jump from track to track. You've got to keep track of a lot of things, and when you want something that's consistent, I think the product at Woodbine is one of the most consi consistent out there. You can really track the trainers, learn some trends, and uh, make some very wise. Uh, decisions on horses to include that may have uh, long odds and horses to throw out that may be uh, vulnerable favorites. Yeah. And the thing that I like from a bankroll perspective is 20 cent pick fours. Remember, wood buying bankrolls all of the Australia wagers. That's why the Australia wagers are 20 cent minimum bets. 20 cent pick fours at Woodbine. And one thing to remember if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, that seems cheap, that seems chintzy, whatever. Remember that a lot of players play for that 20 cent minimum. There aren't a lot of players playing for 50 cents or a dollar. And as a result, those payoffs are not quite as low as you think. It's just a matter of combinations in the pool. And in that case, the low minimum doesn't hurt you. In fact, it allows you to go deeper in races where you need coverage. I was really close to a couple of really good scores. I wound up four for four on Saturday, as you might be able to see on the bottom of your screen. My dad hit the pick four on Sunday. However, JD, I got to tell you, I was darn close to going 12 for 12 in those pick four sequences. And we are going to start off this show with everybody's favorite kind of thing, hearing about a handicapper's bad beat stories. Woo! Okay, Friday. I believe it was a seven or an eight race card. Pick four was races four through seven. I wound up being live to, I forget whether it was three or four horses in the last race, on a $21.60 ticket. Now, those 20 cent minimums can, of course, provide some pretty funky values. 2160 means 108 bets. You can do the math however you want. The horse that I had on my ticket, JD, this horse won by, won by six lengths, won by the size of a Canadian province. There's an inquiry, there's an incident at the top of the stretch. Now, if you want to take a look at the replay of this, this is where you pause our podcast, open up a new tab, go to whatever past performance provider you look at, and watch some replays. A couple of horses did take up. Here's the problem. For one, the horse that won was by far the best horse. It was not even close. The inquiry and the objection and everything that came out of that took between 10 and 12 minutes. It got to where the track announcer at Woodbine, Robert Geller, had to say, still waiting for the official results a couple of different times. JD, I will submit this to you. If an inquiry and a steward's discussion takes 10 to 12 minutes, isn't that evidence enough that the foul in question wasn't all that obvious and probably shouldn't be called? I don't want to, to turn this into a 2019 Kentucky Derby discussion because that's the thing that will immediately be on everybody's minds with an inquiry that's taking way, way, way too long. Um, I, I do think that 
and and this is my defense of Woodbine and something I I don't necessarily you know want to defend a track just for the sake of defending a track that I love. See also a Cinnaboya Downs. Keep going. You you you. you. <laughs> okay. So I, I will say that the policies and things have changed a little bit in relation to getting all the information and talking to the jockeys and I, I've I've seen some some chatter about you know dis disinfecting the phones that are used to talk to the jockeys between each use so it's not as quick of a process if you need to talk to four or five jockeys to get varying opinions from people at the top of a stretch and in that sort of inquiry like we saw i think that's the thing that delayed it i don't think it's right i, I think they have to be quicker with those decisions um i i just you know there's a lot of players in the in the on horse racing Twitter that see that anytime there's a long inquiry, it's going to screw over the player. And some people fall on that side and some people are against that side. All I'm going to say there is times have changed on the track with the Corona preventative measures in there. I'm willing to give tracks the benefit of the doubt right now, just based on some of those procedures. When you have an inquiry as opposed to like a jockey's objection where you've got two jocks and it's going to be quick, given that race and watching that race, they probably had to talk to four or five jockeys, to be honest. I'm willing to let that one go. Well, to be fair, it wasn't a life-changing pick for him. And I think if that horse had won, it would have been $86, $87. Would have been a nice little score, but nothing life-changing. Anyway, I hit the late pick four on Saturday. That was pretty cool. Enjoyed that. The last race was won by a first-time starter uh, who looked like a freak. That's a Charles Fipke horse there. Cheryl Spite, I believe, is the name of the horse. By Spitestown out of a mare named Perfect Sherl, who was very, very good in her day. That's a horse that you're going to want to keep an eye on moving forward. That's not just a Woodbine Stakes quality horse. That's an overall Stakes quality horse. You're going to see that horse down the line in some big spots. We move on to Sunday. J.D., this one hurt. So I gave out the pick four plays on my Twitter account. And if you've seen my Twitter account, you see that we've got some fancy graphics there's a story behind those graphics that I'll get into at another time and why I have them. So I give out the ticket. My dad and I are both alive after the first race. I look at my ADW account. JD, I forgot to play. And there is no worse feeling in horse racing than when you give out a ticket, you like the ticket, you do all the work, and you forget to play it. That hurts. Now, to give you an idea of the roller coaster that I was on here. Favorite wins the second leg, I believe. Nine to two shot wins the third. I would have been six deep in the finale to some pretty decent prices. And at this point, my father, God bless him, is wishing he was anywhere but within 10 feet of me in my living room. Because I was really angry, as I think a whole lot of horse players would be in that situation. Well, again, roller coaster here, folks. So the one horse in the last race re-breaks on the lead. I have the one horse on my ticket. Dad has the 13 horse on his ticket. The 13 comes rolling by in the latter stages, and I wind up being off the hook. I'm laughing for a solid 10 minutes. Now, initially, and JD, I don't think I've even told you this. I wasn't necessarily able to see the saddle cloth color of the horse that was going by. So I was watching the track is dancing numbers down below. And I thought it was the 15 that was going by. You had the 15 on your ticket. And had the 15 gotten home, that payoff would have gone from 190 and some change to something like $600. Dad did not have the 15 on his ticket. He had the 13 on his ticket. So when I saw that the horse that I gave out on my ticket got beat, initially I'm thinking, Dad got beat too. But it winds up being a situation where the 13 gets home, you hit, he hit, I didn't lose. You haven't mentioned my favorite part of this. Well, I I left that to you. I, I posted my ticket. I had eight horses in the last. It was a wide open race. I had the six horses you had, and then I had two more, and those two more ran first and second. Yeah, you did. A, you did a good job. You, it was first and third, by the way. I had the one. 
The one ran second, but okay, the 15 well, yeah. was the bomb that ran third. Still, heck of a handicapping job there, and it was the kind of race where you wanted a lot, and I mean a lot, of coverage. And one thing I will say before we move off of Woodbine, with the advent of Stable Duel, which has finally gotten off the ground, they're doing a pretty cool thing. If you haven't checked it out yet, give it a try. Give it a try. It's not something that's for everybody, but if you like it as an alternative, it's a fun, cool way to keep up with the races, especially if you don't play for a whole heck of a lot of money. With Woodbine Synthetic Surface, horses tend to bunch. Stable Duel's scoring metric goes off of beaten lengths. If you want sort of stable duel on an easier level where, say, your horse runs last but has only beaten five lengths, you're not overly penalized for that, try Woodbine. That's a pretty good introduction to stable duel given the surfaces because, again, when horses tend to bunch up like that, sometimes you wind up not losing as much as you should in a situation where you just need to have a horse in the race and you have $250 in you need to take a big price. It's a pretty cool thing. J.D., I'm not quite sure what the situation is in Arizona, whether you're allowed to play it or not. But, yeah, when in doubt, assume the worst with Arizona and horse players and people being able to do things. Sorry if that was like rubbing salt in a wound there. But anyway, at any rate, Stable Duel is a pretty cool thing. Uh, support the people that are doing that. Hopefully a solution comes up where they're able to offer Naira's product again. The less said about that, the better, because I'm not going to get anybody in trouble with that. But chances are, if something else happens, you'll read about it in the pink sheet this summer. Yes, and the other thing I will say is another track that I think is a good starting track that may not be a track that everybody's familiar with, but Emerald Downs is on that product as well. And uh, they, they did the Thursday night card that uh, just concluded as we're taping this on Thursday night. They had that on Stable Duel today. And I think that's another track with a very fair dirt surface, but with the quality of horses, and, and what I mean by that there is you have a, a very interesting colony of horses that are all you know very, very close to the same talent level. That's another good place to, to start for uh, getting your feet wet with that type of uh, contest. Yeah, and again, it's a cool thing. It's not necessarily something for everybody, but it's something where if you like it, you'll know right away. So keep an eye out for that. We're going to have a chat now about some of the boutique meets that are going on in the country. Keeneland, of course, in the midst of something they have not done, if not ever, maybe a long, 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 long time ago. They're running for a week. They're loading a month's worth of stakes races into a five-day period. JD, as you might remember, I was planning on going to Keeneland back in April. I was supposed to be there for the Makers 46 mile card, was supposed to stay with our dear friends Joe and Natalie Nevels, was supposed to beat those two and Nicole Russo in several rounds of Totopoli and other overly competitive board games. Didn't happen, thanks COVID. But Keeneland offering a couple of really good cards. We'll get into the All Stakes Pick 5 on Saturday in just a bit. But with Keeneland going to that five-day meet, it opens up a case study that a lot of racetracks may very well be eyeing as a sort of saying, hey, wait a minute, instead of running a three or four week meet with a whole bunch of races that don't necessarily fill, why don't we condense that fewer dates, bigger fields, better races? I don't know enough yet to know from a monetary standpoint whether this is working or not, whether it's a case where this was all Keeneland could get in July, but it's something that we're going to need to take a watch for because there are certain tracks, Keeneland, Kentucky Downs in the fall, a couple of others where this structure could definitely work if horse players support it. And it's Keeneland, so horse players are definitely going to support it. Yeah, no, I, I've been you know, all in on Keeneland here to, to start on this week. Um, I've, I've done pretty well. If you followed me on Twitter, um, I have not been giving out selections. Uh, that's been a little selfish of me and I'm going to do a better job of that for, for, for Keeneland for the rest of the week. The one thing I will say is I, I think the next meet I'm going to be, you know, get my, out my crystal ball here and, and try to do my best. I'm not, I'm not reading tarot cards as uh, one of our, uh, one of our friends on Twitter has been doing uh, recently that we, uh, all trust as a handicapper and Don Lupo. I'm just going to bring out the crystal ball. And I say, Ben Crosby meet at Del Mar. I could see that happening. Me too. Um, it's certainly a case where at that time, a lot of horses are off anyway. I could see Los Al doing that as well. Uh, just the way the calendar shapes up, but we'll take a look. I mean, this is a case where tracks are trying different things to see what works. 
They're trying different things to salvage what they can after having to cancel and reschedule a whole bunch of things. And it's a case where a lot of tracks are feeling that now. Del Mar is going to a shortened race week. Saratoga, starting next week, has a bunch of stakes races that were rescheduled from Belmont Park. Even their meet's going to look a little bit different, especially given the whole no fans thing. It's something to watch. It's something to keep an eye on moving forward. Something else to watch, though, is the Saturday card at Keeneland. If you like stakes races, if you like all stakes, horizontal exotic sequences, this is the card for you. Some of the best American horses in training are going to be in action on Saturday in Lexington, Kentucky, and we're going to take a look at the all-stakes pick five. There is a stakes race that comes up before this, but this all-stakes pick five sequence starts in race number five with the grade one Madison. It includes the Madison, the Shaker Town, the Ashland, the Jenny Wiley, and the Bluegrass for three-year-olds. All graded stakes races, several grade ones. We start off with the grade one Madison, always a fun race, a field of uh, multiple pages actually signing on for this one as JD rolls those graphics. A field of nine signing on. The likely favorite is number five, Guarana. And if you've been watching and wondering what we were going to do with the bottom of that screen, if we were just going to roll random facts down there, well, think again because our technical Svengali, JD Fox, has come up with a way in which you're going to be able to see our tickets down below our beautiful faces. And there you see JD going three deep in the Madison. And JD, I see you're using Guarana, but you're not singling her. Not singling her. Um, my, my top choice here is actually going to be Amy's Challenge. Um, I, I think really what you could see here is is Amy's Challenge trip last year in this race where, you know, got an easy lead, stood her ground late, just barely got nipped at the at the uh, wire by Spice Perfection. I, I do like the speed from her. I like the outside draw, especially. I think she can clear this field, and I think she's going to run as honestly as she can for as long as she can. Um, you know, obviously, last time she uh, disappointed a bit in the carousel, ran up against uh, Mia Mischief, and that was not a, a great. Um, you know, performance against me in mischief, but it was a great performance against the rest of the field. You look at horses she beat there. She beat Bella Fina, who came back in the desert storm at Santa Anita and blew everybody away. Uh, so I, I do like the the race coming out there. I will say about me in mischief, I, I think she's a toss here, honestly. Um, last up effort at the winning colors after the carousel was not good. It was no bueno. No excuses there. Just a poor trip. Um, I think as she matures, I think she wants less distance. So stretching back out the seven furlongs, I'm not going to be on board there for that one. Obviously, you talked about the favorite, Garana. I think the key thing here, what we've been looking at, is the weather forecast. And I think Garana definitely is the classiest horse in this field going in. And I think on mud or or you know a lesser surface, I, I do think she pops up quite a bit as well. You know, she's done nothing wrong. She has that second in the cotillion. Uh, she doesn't have a lot of experience, but what she lacks in experience, she makes up for in class. So I'm going three deep there. As you mentioned, Andrew, uh, we're going five, eight, and nine, and we get to keep both of our tickets on the page. It's pretty cool. Yeah, we do. Uh, we really need to give our technical person a raise. Uh, at any rate, I agree with you that if Guarana runs her race, she probably wins, but I do have some reservations. She's never faced the type of older horses she'll run against here. I was never sold on the crop of three-year-old fillies that ran last year. Kavfefi won the Eclipse Award for champion three-year-old filly, and she was not a two-turn horse. That speaks to the lack of quality at the top of the three-year-old filly division last year, going two turns. Orana won a couple of grade one races. One turn is probably her best game, seven furlongs to a mile, maybe the mile and an eighth at Belmont. But she's a defensive use for me in here. My top selection is actually number eight, Bell's the One, who I think could benefit from a speed duel. She came running late to win the grade three winning colors at Churchill at a pretty nice price, and she did the same thing at this very route last year in the Raven Run. She is definitely pace dependent, but I think she'll get the setup in here. You mentioned Amy's Challenge, and I like Amy's Challenge. She's an honest racehorse, was the last horse I threw out of this sequence with Guarana involved, with Mia Mischief involved, a couple of others involved, they're going to go pretty fast early, and I think there's a chance the race falls apart late, and I need Bell's the one on my ticket. In fact, she's my top selection, 6-1 to one on the morning line. Be pretty happy if we get that price. 
Mia Mischief is all class. I like this horse a lot. Seems like she fires every time out, and when she's at her best, she's really good. That start two starts ago in the carousel at Oakland was excellent. I think she may have just bounced last time out in the winning colors. Horses are allowed to have a clunker after an effort like the one Mia Mischief had two back. The big question for me, and you mentioned this, is seven furlongs her best game? She won a grade one going seven furlongs last year, so that may seem like a silly question. But like you, JB, I think she may be better off going six furlongs. Still, though, if Guarana isn't quite ready to tackle grade one older company, Mia Mischief's a classy animal that's very consistent. And if she gets back to her best game, look out. Five, seven, and eight for me in the grade one Madison. Five, eight, and nine for JD. And you're going to notice a theme here. Despite the fact that we're approaching this sequence differently, there does exist a scenario where the two of us can hit. This is not common in sequences that we analyze on this show, so we're going to enjoy this just as much as we can. As we head to race number six, the grade two Shaker Town for older horses going five and a half furlongs on turf, big field. This is a grass grab bag in every sense of the word, and there are a lot of questions about the favorites in this race. Can number two Wild Man Jack run well over a very different turf course than the kinds he has seen? Is bound for nowhere cranked after not being seen since March. I think there's a lot of different directions you can go here, JD. It's the start of the all stakes pick four. So if you get knocked out of the pick five or if a pick five is just a little bit outside your comfortable price range, maybe this is the sequence you concentrate on. And we see this race pretty differently. JD, I'm using your single, but I don't have the kind of confidence that you do in number one extravagant kid. Really, what it comes down to, Andrew, for me on this ticket is you've got to go really deep or you need to take a stand. And I'm really going to take a stand here with Extravagant Kid. And again, I'm also going to reserve the right to change this ticket if the weather suddenly improves in Kentucky and we have gorgeous sunshine and not all the thunderstorms that we're projecting. And this term, this comes out of firm turf course. Completely disregard pretty much all of my handicapping from this point forward. But based on the weather models and everything we know and the people we know in Kentucky and who we've talked to, um, everybody's expecting downpour. So that's what I played for. Um, Extravagant Kid has done it all. I mean, seven-year-old gelding, uh, you you really have to search to find a scenario that that's, this horse hasn't won at. Um, hit the board in all five tries on a wet turf surface. Has a second in a yielding. Um, three wins, including uh, a, a stake year, an overnight, well, it's a little better than an overnight stake at Saratoga that you're familiar with, the lucky coin, um, over a wet surface. Um, I, I really think Extravagant Kid um, is the class here. And the other thing, too, I mean, it's going to take – an absolute deluge and probably a Noah's Ark situation for them to take this off the turf, given the short week and the ability to move the rail and so on and so forth. But I also will give a tip to the cap to extravagant kid who's won his last three dirt races. And not only that, he's won, he won a dirt race uh, earlier this year that he was actually just straight entered in. They entered him in a dirt stake and he won it. Um, I think Extravagant Kid is the most versatile horse here. We have no European turf pedigree that you can find on any horse on this field. I don't know how any of them are going to do except for Extravagant Kid. I know he can go over this going, so I'm taking a strong single here on what I find to be the known quantity in this. Is he the best horse in this field? No, but I feel like I'm getting the fairest shot knowing what I'm getting into by singling Extravagant Kid here. And I know, Andrew, you, you, you tipped it up. You're using my single, but you're going in a completely different direction other than that. I got to tell you, though, J.D., that's a pretty good sell on number one extravagant kid. And this is what Take It Construction is all about. It's singling your strongest opinions. And, J.D., you've got a strong opinion on a horse that figures to be a pretty good price. So I can't fault the single if you've got some confidence in it. I don't have that confidence. You can see down below, I'm six deep. And as mentioned, I've got questions about the favorites. They're defensive uses for me. My top selection is actually number 13, Leanster. Leinster is 12 to 1 on the morning line, came back running off the bench, went second last time out at Churchill Downs, and he likely needed that race. Rusty Arnold's runners tend to run back into form, and Rusty Arnold does tremendous work at Keeneland. He's a stalwart there, and anything close to Leinster's two races here last year would make him a major player at a price. Leinster ran second in the Woodford last year behind Stubbins, a very nice turf sprinter. He's going to need to negotiate a trip from the 13 hole, but... I'm optimistic Leinster can do that. 
The other horse that I'm going to talk up a little bit here is number five, Just Might. And JD, a look in your program will reveal that this horse is 50 to one on the morning line. I think that's way too big a price. I think Just Might has a legitimate shot. He ran a really good race three back to win a stakes at fairgrounds and then went to the sidelines for a couple months. He's run twice since then. He may have been best last time out in his second start off the layoff. He had an eventful trip that day. He's actually beaten a few of the runners that show up in this race. Again, I don't think this one should be 50 to 1. If this one is 50 to 1, that's a significant overlay, and I'll have a few bucks to win on that one. But I'm going six deep in here. One, two, five, eight, nine, and 13. The two favorites in here, defensive uses for me, and I can afford to do that because I have a very strong opinion near the end of this sequence. Two different opinions in race number six. We'll move on to race number seven. This is the grade one Ashland for three-year-old Phillies going a mile and a 16th on the main track. And we've got a very heavy favorite in here. Number two, Venetian Harbor, six to five for Richard Baltus. Joel Rosario will ride. Speech is two to one on the morning line after running second behind Swiss Skydiver last time out. It's a field of six. A lot of people, I imagine, will single Venetian Harbor. If you don't like Venetian Harbor and have deep pockets, maybe this is the spot where you hit the all button. I'm going neither of those directions. I'm going too deep. Venetian Harbor was very nearly a single for me. She certainly seems like the main speed in this race. And if she gets comfortable, she's going to be very tough to catch. Remember, Keeneland's mile in a 16th configuration has a very short stretch. That means that if you hit the front at the top of the lane, you don't have to stay in front very long to hit the wire in front. I think Venetian Harbor leads as the field turns for home. And if she's got anything left, she's going to be tough. However, I need to use number 13, Bonnie South, who gets on my ticket just in case a bigger price or two tries to go with Venetian Harbor early. She's gotten very good of late. She circled the entire field to win the grade two Fairgrounds Oaks last time out. And she has been working up a storm for Brad Cox at Keeneland ahead of this race. Several very strong five furlong drills. I think Bonnie South has a puncher's chance at a price. And the faster they go early, the better her chances figure to be. 2-3 for me in the grade one Ashland. J.D., your thoughts? Before I put my ticket up, I have three opinions on this race. And, they're, and they are in, ranked in order here. I'm going to give my strongest opinion first. Okay. Alta's award will not win this race. Okay. My strongest opinion there. My second strongest opinion is I honestly think that speech is faster than Venetian Harbor. I really? might be crazy, but I do see the possibility of speech from the outside coming over and beating Venetian Harbor to the punch. That sets up who my top selection is in this race, and that's actually Tunnel of Shape, and that's my third strongest opinion. Tunnel of Shape is going to come flying late. Now, really? I need them to go quick enough, but I do think they're going to hold Tunnel of Shape back for one run. But with that being said, I'm still not super confident in this spot, so I'm hitting the all-but-one button of idiocy. Oh. Oh, 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 that could be really painful for you, J.D., I'm just saying. It could be. I, I'm, I, I've seen it happen before. I sincerely hope it doesn't happen again. But we've got common ground in here again because you're using both of the horses that I'm using. This is not common. For first-time viewers of this podcast who may have just recently hit the subscribe button, this does not happen. When we handicap, we usually go in completely different directions. But as we've mentioned... We both could hit this thing. It would be appropriately bizarre, but that's sort of our thing, and that's sort of what we do, so it fits. Yeah, and I still have not given out a winning ticket on this show. I feel You're like due. For, for, You're for, due. For, for first-time viewers of this show, I, I do need to, to throw that out there. But, again, I'm just dreaming. I've got some you know longer shots. When I hit tickets, they pay. You don't see me losing money on on you know i'm putting a, a 60 dollar play in and getting back 40 dollars. that's not how my tickets generally are constructed yeah. so uh, i've got that move that's one of my moves so i, I think the jenny wiley again is is a race that i have a, a very strong opinion but i'm really interested to hear your opinion andrew here uh phillies and mares four-year-olds end up going the mile and a 16th on the turf course at keeneland and again we've got a field of eight here um as we look at the uh, last page of the odds boards. And, and really, Andrew, I'm, I'm really interested to hear your opinion in this race before I give mine. So I'm going to toss the ball over to you here. 
Okay, well, rushing fall is going to be a very heavy favorite, and for good reason. She loves Keeneland, makes a lot of sense in here. The only time in her career she's finished worse than second came when she was inexplicably rated in last year's First Lady. I rewatched that race. I still don't get it. She's a speed horse. I think Javier Castellano whiffed on that one. Her easy win in the grade three bogey to kick off the season hints that she's still in really good form. But your graphics sort of told a story because the first page of the graphic had seven horses. Number eight, Toinette, was sort of forgotten. And that that's on brand for her because nobody really mentions Toinette as one of the better female turf distaffers in the country. She is. She's 8 for 12 with five stakes wins, and she beat Rushing Fall in the Edgewood as a three-year-old. She came back running off of a long layoff to win the Wilshire at Santa Anita. Flavian Pratt rides back for Neil Drysdale, and I wouldn't be shocked if she wanted a bit of a price. Number six, Jolie Olympica, meanwhile, I'm going to defer to you on. She's a defensive use for me. She is an excellent turf sprinter. She just seems okay going longer. She was second behind Keeper of the Stars in her one try going two turns in North America. But Richard Mandela does not ship in for frequent flyer miles when he ships. He usually means business. Mike Smith will ride. And if Jolie Olympica can stretch that speed out across two turns, she is absolutely a contender. And she'll probably be the second choice in this field. So if you like Jolie Olympica, I can't fault you for that. JD, they don't write segues any better than that. Take it away. Obviously, I'm singling Julie Olympica here. If you're a frequent viewer of the show, you may realize, and I and I pulled the direct quote just to make sure. A couple of weeks ago on this very uh, podcast, when I was talking about Alexandra, who I who I just absolutely adored, and obvi- uh, unfortunately injured coming out, and and we're going to be be on the shelf for a little bit. I said that Jolie Olympica was the best turf distaff horse on the West Coast. I said that on this podcast. Yes, you did. I think this is the coming out party, that this is the best turf distaff horse in the country. And really, really? What, I, what I see here is I like a couple moves that we see from Mandel here. Obviously, um, you know the, the one defeat in the career was going a mile. And uh, Keeper of the Stars tracked Jolie Olympica down. Jolie Olympica did not go out as fast as she could in that race. It was a very modest tempo for her because, again, she's you know five and a half, six. She's been a dominant sprinter. I think she can set a little bit of an advantage even from rushing fall in this race just based on natural speed alone. And I think Mike Smith has learned some things. The other thing I really like that Mandel has done is you look at the quick work tab back. I look, I love the July 1st work going seven furlongs and then five days later coming back and running a much quicker five furlong out. So it was a seven furlong to get a little more fitness and then remind the horse that, hey, you're a fast horse and you deserve to be the lead in this race. It wasn't a bullet work by any means, but if you watch the work, you can see that it was a very get out quick and then relax sort of work and Mike Smith was actually aboard for that work as well all things that I'm really 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 in love with with this horse I think it's a single I think it's a gate to wire score and I, I'm really um, hopeful that Jolie Olympica is the horse that I think she could be and is on the path to picking whatever Breeders' Cup race she wants to run in because I think she is not necessarily distance dependent Well, we'll find out a lot for sure. This is going to be a test for Jolie Olympica because it's a good field in the Jenny Wiley. I've liked rushing fall for a while for good reason. Toinette has done a lot of really good things for a talented horseman in his own right, Neil Drysdale. So a lot going on in the Jenny Wiley race number eight. But the main event of the program is race number nine. This is the bluegrass. It's a grade two. Got to tell you, I don't agree with that one, but it's drawn a pretty big field. Number seven, Swiss Skydiver, is a Philly taking on the boys. She's the three-to-one morning line favorite. I'm thinking she drifts down a little bit off of that because eventually word's going to get out to the casual players about a Philly going against the boys, and that will always drive the odds down a couple of points. If that happens, J.D., I don't just like a horse. I love a horse. I don't think that number three art collector will play quite as valuable in the pick five and pick fours as he will to win. But I think art collector 
is hands down the best horse in this race. Tom Drury is a very good horseman. You don't hear his name a lot because he doesn't have a big barn, but he hits at a high percentage pretty continuously. And this one looked like a freak when romping going two turns last time out at Churchill. It was only a four horse field. I grant you that, but it was a good four horse field. The runner up has since come back to win. And the third place finisher, JD, is a horse that you might remember from Arkansas Derby Day, Finnick the Fierce, a horse that ran his heart out to hit the board that day at a big number. He's versatile. Art Collector can go on the lead, he can rally, and he is in the hands of a strong trainer, as I've mentioned. He earned a 100 buyer speed figure last time out, and if he runs back to that race, I think Art Collector is going to be very, very, very tough to beat. Five to one hits me as an overlay. He is a single for me. In the pick five, the pick four, any doubles that I play, any win bets that I play, Art Collector is my best bet of the day, and it's pretty simple. If he wins, I have a good day. If he doesn't win, I have a pretty bad day. Nothing against Swiss Skydiver, who has a lot of talent and certainly deserves to take the shot here. Having said that, I'm just not sold on the quality of this year's three-year-old Phillies. I don't think she's beaten a ton, and she has had a number of dream trips. Going back to the race at Gulfstream Park, where Paco Lopez lulled the field to sleep going 49 to the half. At that point, she was gone. She beat a four-horse field last time out at Santa Anita. I don't think that field was all that great. She did beat Venetian Harbor two back, but I just think Venetian Harbor's a cup below the kind of horses that Swiss Skydiver runs up against here. If Swiss Skydiver wins, fine. We've got a filly on the Derby Trail. That's fantastic. It's a good story. I think our collector wins this race, and I'll be very, very, very happy if our collector comes home and finishes off my $54 ticket. I have a lot of conviction in this race. JD, what are your thoughts? I do not trust a single horse in this race. <laughs> there we go. That's the yeah. spirit. If this was not in a betting sequence where I like the rest of the races, I would not be wagering a single dime on this race. Really? Because I really honestly believe that anybody could win, and I still don't think I can look at the tote board and define value. And when we're in situations like that, I've constructed my ticket very uniquely. And before we get to my ticket, we're going to have a little bit of fun here because okay. normally we give, you know, who's the top selection going to be? Who are you going to talk about? Like, obviously, I, I knew that even before I saw his ticket that Andrew was not going to talk about the horse that I actually think is super sneaky in this race <laughs> to the point where I think Andrew will go through this field and guess at least 10 or 11 times before he gets to the horse that would be my top selection if someone was absolutely forcing me to make one. So, Finish. Andrew, okay. do you, would you like the field graphics back up? Or yes, I gonna... would. Thank you. Okay, we can we can certainly do that here. So we're going to go. Right. This is page one. All right. Finnick the Fierce. No. Mr. Big News. No. Shivery. No. Keep going. I'll, I'll give you a hint. Not on page one. <laughs> then you showed me page one for no reason. It's a red herring. Um, enforceable. No. Boy, I liked Enforceable going 12 furlongs in the Belmont. There's an alternate universe where he's the Belmont winner. Rushy. No. Okay. I liked Rushy a little bit in the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, ran well that day to be third. Um, uh, Tiesto. Yes. Let's, let's, get, let's fire up the dance music here. Tiesto, who has not <laughs> ran <laughs> on, the, on the dirt yet. Yes, I just dabbed everybody, just so you know. But what we need to look at is the dam and maybe some familial relations there. Okay. You look at the dam, marquee delivery. Okay. Synthetic all-weather course. I will give you that every day of the week. She was very dominant at Keeneland when they had an all-weather surface. So she likes her, you know, she liked the surroundings. I mean, that's all about we can take away there. But you look at her progeny. 102 starts, 55 of them have been dirt starts. And you look at the half-brother that Tiesto has. You know, we were excited on Belmont Stakes Day to have the 2020 debut of this half-brother and obviously got scratched and we're waiting to see where the next spot is going to be. But 
promises fulfilled is is the half brother here now obviously different sire but i do look at that damn side and that damn side has done very well with multiple sires with dirt and i don't think this is a turf horse i think that's the one thing we've defined through the through the uh the overnight stakes and the and the grade three palm beach which was a, a really good effort at Gulfstream. I think this could be a dirt horse, and I think it's sometimes tough when, you, when you've when you got a, a dam that was synthetic turf, if you're not familiar with it, and obviously Bill Mott knows a whole hell of a lot about spotting horses more than I do. But I do think there is enough hidden dirt pedigree in this to make this a very interesting horse. This horse likes to stick close to the lead and make one run, and I think with this field and this setup, I think we're going to see a lot of horses strike to the lead and i think this horse could be big but with all of that said andrew i've hit the all button of glory here there we go because I, again i i think with the two singles that we have here neither of my singles are going to be the the favorite in the race um right. and my my single in in leg two is is six to one morning line probably honestly going to be eight to one nine to one depending on the scratch situation the weather situation so on and so forth so you look at that and say okay i'm taking some stands against favorites even if we get you know even you know even a swiss skydiver comes home here to end my ticket based on the rest of the construction of the ticket this ticket's going to pay so i'm okay in a situation like this where i do not trust a single horse in this field i do not think this is a great two race and i think anybody can win so i'm going to hit the all button of glory here it makes my ticket a little expensive it's going to be 9750 for the 50 cent pick 5 which is just about the absolute i max out um, on a pick 5 ticket anywhere but I think with my ticket structure, if if this comes through, this is a you know close to the ticket I just missed on today, Andrew. I mean, this is a twenty five, twenty six hundred dollar uh, pick five score. Yeah, and there are a lot of different ways that you can attack this sequence. As we've mentioned, you can take some parts of our tickets you like, throw out some parts of it you don't like, throw in your own opinions. The important thing is get involved. This is a really fun sequence, both the pick five and the pick four that begins in race number six. There are going to be a lot of big pools at Keeneland. We'll have these tickets. We'll have some other insights on Saturday. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we really hope that you tune in for that. So ninety-seven fifty for JD, 54 for me. Art Collector, a big, big key for me. Five to one on the morning line. I really, really hope we get that price. Please, 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 please. Now... We move on to our final thoughts, and I am going to yield to JD first because I've got something that I need to say, and unfortunately, it's not on the super happy fun note. So, JD, if you want to maybe you know cleanse the palate before we go in to some of the deep water, by all means, go ahead. Pay attention to takeouts. That's my final thought for today. Uh, Grant's pass downs uh, finished up their racing season last night. And they have a 15% uh, pick five takeout. And they had a big carryover. It's a jackpot wager on the final night. So uh, effective takeout actually ended up being a, a negative take. So basically for every dollar that was bet, it was $1.30 back last night. People weren't betting into that pool. But they were betting into the Assiniboia Downs jackpot pick five, which has an effective takeout of 75%. And they bet six times the amount of money. So a lot of things have been happening on Twitter where people have been posting t takeouts. And obviously I, I sometimes play some tracks that don't have the, you know, the most, you know, beautiful takeout uh, patterns in their multi-race exotics. But in those situations, I know what I'm doing. I'm playing a smaller ticket. I know that there's a risk reward there of playing a larger ticket. In a case like Keeneland, I tend to, based on their takeout structure, I tend to play more tickets just because in both the pick five and the pick six, four of five and five of six will always pay. So you're going to get something back. It may not be the entire cost of your ticket, depending on what leg you miss out on, but you will get something back there. I just say look at the takeout uh, percentages when you're making a multi-race exotic. And I'm not saying you don't play a, a, a multi-race exotic at a, at a racetrack that's at you know 25% or more takeout, which there are some there um, running right now in both the U.S. and Canada. But what I will say is 
be thoughtful and be mindful when you're making your budget for those races and making sure that you're getting the most for your dollar. Now, the one thing I will add to that is while it's okay and encouraged to be mindful about the takeouts at tracks and wagers that you play and that you don't play, don't be a takeout snob. If you're criticizing somebody's ticket simply because there's a takeout that you don't like, don't play yourself. Yeah. Other people have different opinions, and you know what? Different opinions are okay. Having said that, here's the water we got to dive into. JD, if you want to hit the Jaws music, by all means, go ahead. Um, earlier this week, Tom Van Meter was outed as making racist comments on a Facebook page. Tom Van Meter, a uh, big player in the breeding game, one of the breeders of American Pharaoh, among other big name horses, big ticket horses. And the remarks that he made were repulsive. They were scary in the nature in which they were made, talked about putting people of a certain color back in cages. It was bad. We condemn that on this show. We condemn that everywhere in every possible way. And there are a number of racing institutions out there that should be commended for some of the stances that they have taken. Keeneland, for instance, will not associate with Tom Van Meter, will not offer Tom Van Meter horses in their upcoming sales. Kudos. You did the right thing. I'm going to challenge a couple of organizations. I'm going to challenge Phasing Tipton, who has said nothing about this, to do the right thing. I'm going to challenge OBS to do the right thing. This is not hard. This is not complicated. We cannot have people that think this way, people who act this way in this game. And JD, I don't know about you, but the apology that he issued to me stunk to high heaven. It seemed like he wasn't sorry for what he said. It seemed like he was sorry he got caught. When you bring up the fact that he said on a private Facebook page, bullshit, I'll say that, bullshit. No, there is no place for people who think like that, people who say these things, people who act this way, and people who enable these things. We talked about this on the show last week that we did with Ken Rudolph. We didn't do that for points. We did that because we understand there's a problem. There are problems in racing, there are problems in society, and those problems get worse when good people do nothing. So please, basic, OBS, do something. The other thing I'll, I'll add, Andrew, is um, I think um, Alicia Wincy Hughes and Alex Waldrop at the NTRA did a great job. They were kind of the first out of the gate with a message uh, condemning this behavior. And, and I think, you know, we we often get into, you know, things in, in horse racing Twitter, especially about, you know, not having that governing body, but the NTRA kind of being a representative of certain voices in the industry and i do think this is a this is a, a message that they're willing to step up to the plate and and make meaningful messages out there and hopefully make meaningful change so that's one of those days where you know being an ntra member and, and giving them some of my hard-earned money I, I i felt some pride there that i was working and, and presenting uh, an organization with with my hard-earned buck that uh, that's really going to go to bat for me as a horse player and and be and not just as a horse player as a human being um, yeah, so really, really impressed by their message and how quickly it came out. Yeah, there are a number of organizations that have done similar things and whatnot. And we can nitpick as far as some of the messages and some of the things we liked, some of the things we didn't like, whatever. The important thing is, if you see something that is wrong, say something and hold people accountable. I cannot stress that enough. That's something that I've promised to do. And it's not something I'm doing for points. It's something I'm doing because it's the right thing to do. Uh, the views that Tom Van Meter espoused have no place in racing, in society, anywhere. And there are some organizations that haven't said anything, guys. And I say guys because there's not a whole lot of women in charge in certain places. Guys, your silence is damning. Do something about this. Now we're going to end that show on that note. Hopefully people listen. Hopefully organizations that haven't said or done anything yet get their act together and get their act together sooner rather than later. We've got a lot going on in racing. Del Mar opens up this week. This place back here, Saratoga Racecourse, opens up on next Thursday, July 16th. I will have analysis and selections in the pink sheet. 
on andrewschampagne.com, on my personal Twitter account, at Andrew Champagne. We might break down a couple of races here on the show, just saying uh, I, I like our chances to, to do that. And there's a lot going on in a lot of different places. Uh, Woodbine is starting to heat up. I like playing Woodbine now because horses are starting to run back and you're starting to be able to see horses running their second or third races off of layoffs. That's pretty cool. Pleasanton is still doing what they can to put on the best cards that they can under the circumstances there. Shout out to our buddy Chris Griffin and to everybody in the Pleasanton racing office. A lot going on in racing. Can't say things are back to normal. They're not. We don't know when things are going to be back to normal, but seeing Del Mar running, seeing Saratoga running, seeing a lot of these tracks running, and seeing some of the stakes races that we're going to see this weekend, J.D., it's a good distraction from a lot of the rigors of the real world. Yeah, really, in, in talking to industry friends this week when we're working on side projects and, and just having general discussion about things, it does seem like, and, and maybe this started last week, but it does feel like we're getting back to being busy with racing and having to choose between tracks to cover, tracks to handicap, that sort of thing. For a while, we were just, with this with this pandemic, we were just having to all-you-can-eat buffet because we, we didn't have enough tracks to really fill the plate. And now we have more than enough uh, for states other than Arizona. Um, I'm still going to be just getting at my bits and pieces. And that's why I'm really happy with Keeneland um, and their product and what they're doing, because that's something I can bet. Um, and obviously Belmont, Saratoga, Nairo were good. Um, you know, not being able to bet at Del Mar this weekend stinks. Um, there's, there's no way around saying that it stinks. Um, it's, it's one of the, I know you, you've got a fondness in your heart for Saratoga. I, I have that same thing with Del Mar and just not being able to wager it without uh, a long car drive, uh, which I do not, particularly want to take now um you know no trips to norco for me um which would be the nearest uh uh otb on the california side i'm sorry for knowing that yeah um we could go into a lot of different stories about delmar including one story that i'm specifically saving for when certain people retire and or pass away that might be in my memoirs which are coming out when i need a sudden influx of pick four money or when we start selling advertising on this show. We've shown the email address down there at the bottom of the screen. If you're interested in advertising, if you're interested in anything to have to do with this show, write us. We take a look at that email address. We'll respond as quickly as we can. If you like what we're doing, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our weekly offerings. That'll wrap things up for this edition of Champagne and JD, and it's pretty fitting that Stay Off the Beaches is right down there on the bottom. I will add something to that please wear a mask. If you want to return to normal, if you want sports other than racing, wear a mask, do your part, better safe than sorry, take it from somebody that's lost somebody to this thing. Wear a mask, even if it gives you the sort of mask burn that I have from playing Pebble Beach in a mask on Monday, it's not quite as bad as it was earlier in the week, but you can still sort of see red up in through here and then really pale down in here. Trust me, I'm very happy we didn't film this on Monday night or Tuesday, JD. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the Pebble Beach story, I, I, mentioned, I put it in the bottom there. That's something we'll have to talk about another day because that's, that's a, uh, something I'm, I'm very uh, jealous of you. But I, the one bone pick I have with you is the name of the course. What is the name of that course, Andrew? Pebble Beach Golf Links. Yeah, it's got beach in it. Stay off the beaches. I wasn't on the beach. My golf balls, however, occasionally wandered over there. But there was an over-under on my Twitter pool talking about how many balls I would lose. The over-under was seven and a half. Comfortably under. Five. Five. So if you went there and you played the over, you lost. Anyway. But, but if you played that, over on the score, you won. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the course ate my lunch, back nine specifically. I'll be writing about that on andrewschampagne.com in the coming days. That'll probably go online this weekend with some pictures and some videos. Life-changing experience. It was freaking awesome, and there's a lot, a lot that went into that. So I look forward to sharing that with everybody. Andrewschampagne.com is where you can read that. For J.D. Fox, I'm Andrew Champagne. Thanks very much for watching this edition of Champagne and J.D. As he mentioned, as we've mentioned every week, Stay off the beaches.